Good morning, everyone. I've got 10 o'clock central here and we will begin our roadside chat. The wonders of wildflowers. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Jennifer Carpenter and I'm a historian with Textot's environmental affairs division. I'm joined today by textile landscape architect, Sandra Chipley. Environmental specialist and biologist, Matt Buckingham and vegetation specialist, Travis Jez. In today's webinar, you will learn about the history of our wildflower program, about the wildflowers our biologists encounter in the field, and how TechStop manages our roadsides during and after wildflower season. Many of us at TechStop are continuing to navigate this virtual world, so we appreciate your patience and hope today's webinar goes off without any technical glitches. But before we begin, a little bit of housekeeping. This webinar does include a PowerPoint presentation, so if you're only joining us by phone, we can get you a copy of the presentation upon request. If you have any questions at any point during the webinar, you can type them into the Q&A box. You can also enter questions in the chat and send them to the host. We'll answer all of the questions at the end of our presentations. And then the webinar is being recorded and it'll be available on our website after today's presentation. So you need to come back um, or want to check it out again. Our agenda today will include a brief overview of TechStot and our Beyond the Road initiative and how we care for the environment. We'll then move into our Wonders of Wildflowers presentation followed up by the questions, the Q&A, and we'll wrap up and adjourn by 12 p.m. Uh, before we begin, I wanted to draw your attention to our Roadside Chat webpage. This is a great place to visit to check out past webinars, as well as future topics we'll cover in our upcoming sessions. Um, in October, we invite you to join us for an archeology span webinar about some amazing discoveries in Star County. So make sure to register for that once the link becomes available. All right, if you've lived in Texas long, you know that the moment the first blue bonnets pop up along the roadside, that spring is close. But did you know that TechStop planted those wildflowers or that we have a wildflower program? At TechStot, we go beyond the road to protect and enhance the environment. For example, TechStot plants over 30,000 pounds of wildflower seeds along the roadsides each year. We've started this effort in 1932, and we've been doing it ever since. Planting flowers helps our state's pollinators, cuts down on mowing costs, and prevents roadside erosion. Today, we'll learn about TechStot's wildflower program, how it began, and how it operates today. We'll also talk about the ways you can help protect roadside wildflowers so that everyone can enjoy them. TechStot's wildflower program encourages the planting of native species, or in other words, the plants that make Texas what it is. Today, we'll learn more about these plants, where they are found, and how you can identify them. The wildflower program demonstrates TechStot's commitment to the environment. Wildflowers and the natural environment is just really one area that our planners, engineers, biologists, archaeologists, and historians think about when they review projects. They consider questions like, will this project disrupt the quality of air and water, create higher noise levels, put endangered plants or animals at risk, or negatively impact a community and its resources. Our environmental work happens before construction even starts. And this is just part of the work that TechStot every day, TechStot does every single day, but not a lot of people know about it. Our environmental work is guided by state and federal laws like the National Environmental Policy Act. The review processes required by this law can take several years, but it helps us safeguard important natural features, landscapes, neighborhoods, animals, historic sites, and archeological sites. These laws also rely on public input and feedback, so you're an important part of the process. When our environmental work leads to unique discoveries, we wanna share them with you. So we develop uh, posters, videos, podcasts, and more, all part of our campaign, which we call Beyond the Road. But that's not all. This Beyond the Road campaign also involves you, the public. Working with the public has helped us learn about the environmental resources that are most important to you. For more information about this program, you can visit our website and use the keyword beyond the road. 
You may have been to one of our previous roadside chats, which has focused more on historic preservation topics. So before we move into today's wildflower presentation, I wanted to share two updates about TxDOT's historic preservation efforts. Like all of our environmental review efforts, public involvement is critical. The process, however, can be a little bit confusing. So to help Texans better understand their role in the historic preservation process, we've recently launched a Section 106 virtual training platform. This interactive training is self-paced and it teaches you all about TxDOT's processes and how you can get involved. The training platform um, includes ways for you to explore um, webinars about historic preservation and the 106 process, helps you understand current archeological and historical projects. You can download free brochures and outreach materials, explore our federal and state partners websites and their resources, you can learn about our historic bridge program, um, understand common project definitions, and provide your feedback. So we really would love for you to visit the website and check it out. Again, it's all virtual. You click and point and go to different sections. We've got the website listed down below there. Um, I can also put it in the chat. We hope that you visit it and check it out. And while our environmental processes are governed by laws and regulations, we do have the opportunity to tailor them. And we do this by creating agreements with our federal and state partners that detail how we'll complete our work. Our agreement for historic preservation um, will help us determine how, when, and what resources uh, we use during our processes under Section 106. Um, and then once we complete a draft of our agreement, we got to, everybody has to sign off on the plan and it becomes legally binding. We're updating our programmatic agreement to improve the effectiveness of our historic preservation process by increasing the number of projects that do not require in-depth studies. The goal here is to focus our attention on the projects that do negatively impact cultural resources and increased efficiency saves the agency and the public time and money. We'd like you to visit our webpage and complete a survey where you can share your thoughts on historic preservation process and tell us what types of resources matter most to you. I'll put the link in the chat and remember his uh, public involvement is at the heart of historic preservation. Your voice matters and we've got a little um, initiative to help you maybe fill out the survey. If you do fill it out, you will receive a free packet of wildflower seeds because fall is the best time to plant for spring. So there's my little hook back into our wildflower. And with that, we're going to move into today's programming. So I will go ahead and let Sandra Chipley, our landscape architect, take it away from here. Thank you, Sandra. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, good morning. And as Jennifer mentioned, I'm Sandra Chipley. I'm a landscape architect with TechStot, and I'll be present. I will be presenting. The first portion of our presentation, and that's mainly on the historical background of our beautification program and our wildflower program. So let's get going. Uh, let's make sure I know how to do the changes on this one. That is not the right direction. Here we go. So. Um, around the turn from the 19th to the 20th century, the automobile arrived in Texas, but the soils and the weather did not cooperate with the wagon roads of the time. Um, wow, uh, well, cars were not going away, so it was necessary to build a more sustainable road and highway system in the state of Texas, as well as throughout the nation. So the Texas Highway Department was organized in 1917 to plan and build those roads. Um, but the legislature had already declared the blue bonnet to be the state flower in 1901. Texans have been enamored with wildflowers for years, really for centuries. Nanny Huddle is considered the first to paint a field of blue bonnets and evidently I think it was in front of the Capitol um, and maybe that was around the turn of the century. She was followed by Julian Onderdonk and Robert Wood, and of course later by Porfirio Salinas. And I have to include my own great grandfather, the Northeast Texas artist Frank Moore Burr, who also got caught up in this craze that was referred to as the Blue Bonnet School. 
While Texas was getting excited about its upcoming centennial in 1927, um, it was anxious to prove that to the rest of the country that it had culture. Um, meanwhile, Edgar B. Davis, who lived in Luling, um, ended up becoming an overnight millionaire with a gusher, and the gusher, um, the oil gusher, came in under evidently a field of wildflowers, and he decided to celebrate by sponsoring a wildflower painting competition in San Antonio. And this led to the Blue Bonnet School going on steroids. Meanwhile, back to the actual roadsides, with the leveling out and grading and paving of this new road system, it was noticed that the first vegetation to reappear was the wildflowers uh, that were native to each area. And that was really important because we were concerned about revegetating the disturbed areas. By 1929, Judge W.R. Ely, um, a member of the Texas Highway Commission, had lobbied Gib Gilchrist, who was the chief highway engineer, over to his ideals of highway scenic beauty along with tree planting and tree preservation. In 1930, Gib Gilchrist issued his historic policy memorandum on tree preservation in the right-of-way, which included Joyce Kilmer's immortal poem, Trees. Paralleling the highway department's landscape efforts was the work of women's clubs and garden clubs from across the state. The Bureau of Roadside Development was established within the department in 1931, and that same year, the Texas Federation of Women's Clubs Beautification Program was planned by Gutzon Borglum. You may remember him. He was a nationally acclaimed sculptor. He was known for his work um, on Mount Rushmore. And he was hired by the Texas Highway Department's Park Board to plan for the 1936 Texas Centennial. He created a statewide plan for highway improvement through plantings of blue bonnets and red buds along the highway, and that along with a series of monuments. And we think that was probably more for the Central Texas and East Texas areas, um, because he also promoted plans for palms and native flower and shrub gardens along the roadsides intermittently in the valley and that also with monuments. Meanwhile, members of the garden clubs and also of the Boy Scouts of America collected and spread seeds along the roadsides as they traveled across the state. 1933 to 1940 was the true heyday of the roadside development division. The highway department hired its first landscape architect. His name was Jack L. Goebbels. Uh, they hired him in 1933. You might see in some of our literature, he was hired in 1932, but that was really as on a consultant and part-time basis. 1933, he was full-time. He had been born in Holland in 1896. He studied landscape architecture in Germany, then immigrated to America in 1923, and 10 years later, he's working for us. Through his own design firm, he had already done work on Sam Houston's homestead on the campus of what's now, uh, I'm sorry, what was then called Sam Houston State Teachers College in Huntsville. And he had prepared restoration plans for the San Jacinto battlefield um, that would restore it to, from a cow pasture to a bucolic landscape uh, in anticipation of the centennial. His first duty at the highway department, as he considered it, was to enhance, the, enhance awareness of the benefits of beautifications, not just to the public, but also to the highway engineers. Uh, he also encouraged a few miles of planting from each town and requested counties to donate an extra width of right away for rest areas um, a few miles from each town. He emphasized native plants use and it also he posed that highways could be less expensive, not more expensive, if they incorporated the proper planning and landscape architectural principles. Many of those first projects included wildflower seeding, tree planting, and erosion control. Other projects included the Texas Centennial markers, uh, state boundary markers, roadside parks, and centennial plantings. 
<clears throat> Goebbels encouraged cities to adopt an appropriate plant species to symbolize their communities. Palestine chose dogwoods, the valley chose palms, and this appears to be when uh, Tyler chose its rose. A young Lyndon Baines Johnson was named the Texas director, uh, the first Texas director of the National Youth Administration in 1935. And those youths worked closely with Goebbels and the Highway Department to complete all of these projects. We found articles that encourage wallflower tours or driving tours, um, and, and they kind of start in 1937. Um, evidently, the rains in the fall of 1936 and the temperatures in the spring had um, yielded a bumper crop of wildflowers throughout the state. Um, and Goebbels, in this particular article, and I think the Yoakum Herald, he mentions that, and, you know, he's been here in Texas for 10 years at this time, and he's never seen anything like it um, being completely across the state. In other articles, he's recommending uh, wildflower tours or essentially field trips for school children um, for April 23rd, which was considered at that time Children's Day. Uh, here's some statistics from the first five years of the landscape programs at the highway department. And if you note the note, the number of flower seed and grass seed and vines and perennials planted, this is from 38 to, I'm sorry, from 1933 to 1938. The flowers, the vines and perennials, uh, and even some of the shrubs that are mentioned are all considered wildflowers. They, in fact, um, they planted, I'm sorry, I think I have a little bit of a zoom on this. Yeah, sorry about that. In fact, they planted uh, so many native plants that staff uh, became concerned about availability and affordability of the plant material. And so they started their own nursery at Camp Mabry in Austin, where our old headquarters was. So here's a little information on highways and how they were first designed. This is called a road profile, which is a, a section cut through the middle of the road. Uh, in the beginning, the engineers adopted the common railroad design practices of um, digging out dirt on either side of the center of the road and piling it in the middle and building up the roadbed so that we don't end up getting, uh, we avoid what we saw in those earlier pictures, you're building it up so water can drain away from the uh, surface of the road. Um, but this led to um, some issues. One was it became, these became so steep that water runs faster down a steeper slope and is more ten, tending to erode quicker before you can reestablish the vegetation or germinate the seeds, regerminate seeds in that area. And then the other problem they ran into is people were just starting to buy cars and they didn't know how to drive. Um, so they were running off the road quite frequently and on these steeper slopes, there was more of a chance of a more serious accident if, when they ran off the road. Um, so Goebbels, one of the things he encouraged was enlarging the right of way um, or widening the right of way and then um, making those ditches, or these are called bar ditches, for instance, right here, making those more and more shallow uh, in order to, um, um, for the safety and for the erosion control. Here's some before and after photos of that. Um, and this still, though, left the need for revegetating uh, this regraded area uh, to prevent erosion, even in these shallower slopes. There's still areas that are too sleek, too steep, I'm sorry, especially near bridges when you're raising the roadbed up uh, in order to, to have water flow under it. And this is one of those examples. And in this example, what they've done is they've clad the uh, steep slope with um, a native stone from the area, and then they planted yuccas between the road, edge of the road 
in uh, that steep slope, and those are to signal to the driver to stay alert that there might be a more hazardous area um, in this area. Devices called retards, and uh, they're called retards because they retarded the speed of the water flow through the bar ditch we talked about before, enough to minimize the impact of the erosion. And these were installed uh, periodically along the center line of the ditch. So on this photo, you see the ditch going through right here. And in this case, they use prickly, par prickly pears, I'm sorry, as retards, and those are kind of considered wallflowers too. Um, and those were planted at a perpendicular to that flow of the water, and they were periodic. So, for instance, maybe these are 60, 50, 60 feet apart. In the distance, you see also they had a different kind of planting on the slopes um, back there. Uh, slowing down the water allowed a more stable situation for a successful seed germination in the disturbed soil. In Goebbels' book, American Highways and Roadways, which was published in 1938, he makes these statements about wildflowers. He says, the highways of America should become seedling grounds and great reservoirs of wildflowers indigenous to each region. And he also says, these flowers and flowering shrubs and vines not only adorn the roadside and perfume the air, but they serve as a constant source of delight for nature lovers. So take Take a look at that phrase that perfumed the air uh, and, and recall that the automobiles of that time weren't driving as fast as they are today. They didn't have the miles per hour we are allowed nowadays and they didn't have air conditioning. So perfuming the air was an important thing. A couple of other things he refers to in the book related to wildflowers was one that they needed protection. And then the other that they needed, we needed to think about propagation. And under protection, uh, he mentions that the that a number of states had already um, had laws prohibiting roadside, uh, what they call roadside flower gathering. And then he also mentioned that the public really needed to be um, um, convinced that they were there for their own public pleasure. And once they were convinced of that, they would protect them. Uh, and then the third thing was uh, he, as we all know today, um, said that you needed to institute mowing controls because the plant, the plants, the wallflowers had to mature and go to seed before you mowed, or otherwise you, you would tend to lose them. And so that's that seasonal mowing that we do today. He used examples of what he was doing already in the Texas uh, Highway Department, and one of those was um, we had annual flower wildflower exhibits at each of our 25 districts, and the district office worked together with local garden clubs to do uh, those garden shows. And here's some examples of uh, photos of some of the garden shows. And lastly, he mentioned propagation. And the, um, he says, you know, we're in a great situation. We've got, um, we're right there by the highway where the cars are driving by and the wind and suction from the vehicles scatters the seeds. So that's a perfect location for wildflowers. Um, and he used this list of items, he, he refers to, this is what we're doing in the Texas Highway Department. So he mentioned that they had, they collect and spread the seeds and the low and growing, I'm sorry, the low growing seeds either gathered by hand a lot of times, they mowed and threshed to get the seeds or they mowed and hayed. This photograph over to the right is really a more modern photograph of that same practice of mowing and haying where you're uh, taking it to um, an area that needs to be, um, means more of a revegetation and maybe you're taking it from where you had a construction site where it was all going to be destroyed. He also mentions the garden club spreading the seed that we talked about before. And he says that they, the highway department was spreading about 20 tons of seed a year. The uh, landscape architectural staff was scattered at this time, was scattered over, at least by 1940, was scattered over the 25 districts 
with employee position titles of roadside developers. They came from a variety of professional backgrounds, the landscape architects, architects, uh, nurserymen, engineers. Um, and in, what you might find interesting is one of our roadside developers was Edward Tease Jr. And he worked in our Beaumont uh, district office. And he was uh, from the Tease family, the Tease nursery family in Houston. And then Wilson B. Holden in the Lubbock district eventually owned a, a well-known nursery in Lubbock. A recently discovered uh, report sheds light on many of the practices of, of uh, development throughout the state. In 1940, Goebbels asked all of his roadside developers to prepare essays on specific subjects that he knew that they were uh, had an expertise on, and 24 of the 25 districts um, were represented in the publication. The various reports uh, addressed erosion control, planting, transplanting, watering, species selection, uh, and traditional experimental uh, practices, for instance. Here are some erosion and seeding planting recommendations uh, that one essay covered. For instance, in uh, for wind erosion in Armstrong County, they said bring a um, cotton burrs, dump them in piles along the road shoulders or the side of the road, bring in a maintainer, which is a big piece of uh, equipment, spread that out the piles and mix that with the sand and that's temporarily stabilizing it. And then wait till the next rain is about to come, rain or snow, and then go out and seed with uh, yellow sweet clover and sand drop seed. This uh, developer also mentioned uh, soil erosion, and he mentioned using grass retards, Georgia King retards. We talked about what the retards were, and then uh, cactus on cut and fill. So cactus, for instance, is the prickly pear cactus, and a cut is when you take dirt out of an area, and a fill is when you put new dirt in an area. So both of those situations need uh, restabilization or revegetation. This also brings uh, a point, brings up a point um, that we today, some of their practices we don't do anymore. For instance, Georgia cane is considered a, a major invasive and we were trying to control in the state. So uh, some of the items on their list aren't used anymore or um, for, for good reason. And some maybe um, just we've forgotten about um, the, their usefulness. One developer uh, lists these wildflowers for erosion control in a bar ditch, um, in addition to uh, other plant materials that they mentioned. This photo really doesn't show this particular plant material, but it does show a practice that they may have used where they did put in some uh, rock, like we do today, rock berms, and then put the seed in there to hold. Uh, and then also he uses, um, he lists a second group, for plants at a culvert or bridge wing walls. And these would have been put in both for safety um, and for, as a safety signal, and then also as erosion control measure. And he's listed a couple of Nolinas and Maximilian sunflower. And we have a photo of a, a sunflower at a culvert um, in this exact situation. From the reports, we see that knowledge of the science and control of cotton or Texas root rot was critical in Texas at the time in plant selection. And the root rot, uh, I guess, was worse in West Texas than in East Texas. So uh, one developer listed, uh, these are wildflowers that are resistant to root rot. And then these are some that are extremely susceptible to root rot. Note the, um, the common and the scientific names that are uh, given have changed, may have changed over the years, along with their spellings. I've tried to keep the names exactly as they appeared in the reports for historical accuracy. Here are some references mentioned in the reports. As you, as you see, bulletins from the Ag Station were important, uh, especially to the ROT program. Um, I'm sorry, the ROT, <laughs> ROT problem. 
are the, the cotton or Texas root rot. I, I think they might have mentioned some other bulletins, but I wanted to pull that one out in particular. And then uh, two wildflower reference books that you may never have heard of, I don't know, uh, were the Texas Wildflowers by Ellen D. Schultz and Texas Flowers in Natural Color by Eula Whitehouse. Ellen D. Schultz uh, was instrumental in founding the Whitty Museum in San Antonio and was its first director. And I had to look up Eula Whitehouse because her name sounded very familiar to me when I came across it. It turns out her herbarium was the one donated to the city of Fort Worth's Botanic Gardens when I worked my first job as a landscape architect for the parks department there in the mid 80s. You can find out more about both of these fascinating women by checking the Handbook of Texas History. The Dallas Roadside Developer provided list of uh, plant materials being used in the roadside in his district. And here's the list of the wildflowers with their scientific names uh, as they were at the time. As I mentioned over the years, botanical names sometimes change or scientific names sometimes change. Um, Sometimes the plants are reclassified. It's very interesting to follow that line of horticultural history, but it's not the trail we're following today. In comparison, here's Brownwood districts, <clears throat> excuse me, Brownwood districts list of wildflowers, and they had so many, I didn't have room for the scientific names on those. Interesting for me is the frog fruit listed over to the left. Uh, when I worked for Austin's new airport project at the turn of the 21st century, which I guess that uh, that makes me look old, sorry. Um, we planted frog fruit thinking it was a native that hadn't really been used before or um, if at all. And we had to encourage growers to grow it for our project. And this brings us to Texas impact on the highways of the nation. That young Lyndon Baines Johnson became LBJ, the president, in 1963, and he um, served until 1968. His commitment to supporting the nation's youth carried over into his presidency. At the same time, his wife, Lady Bird, took her ideals of roadside beautification from Texas with her to the White House. Her influence is felt today throughout the nation. The signing of the law uh, of the Highway Beautification Act into law of the Highway Beautification Act signaled the nation's commitment to the beautification of the roadside and Texans took it to heart um, in their bragging rights for the, having the best wildflowers on their highways. After they left the White House, Lady Bird started the Texas Highway um, Department's beautiful Roadside Beautification Awards to encourage employees to do more for beautification. And that was in 1970, and it continued for many years uh, afterwards. Here she is with the nominees from one of the years. And as you probably all know, Lady Bird went on to uh, found, along with Helen Hayes, the National Wildflower Research Center in 1982 in East Austin. And in 1995, they opened the first five acres of the center you know today, which is now part of the University of Texas system. I hope you've enjoyed this tour of our wildflower history today. And I'd also like to especially thank our Texas archivist Ann Cook for many of today's photos. Here's some a little bit of the bibliography for my presentation and uh, photo credits with that. And if you'd like to contact me, here's my information. And now I'll pass the wand on to Matt Buckingham, who will provide you with a more in-depth look at our beloved uh, wildflowers themselves. Started off muted. <laughs> Thank you, Sandra. My name is Matt Buckingham. I am a biologist with the Natural Resources Management Section of TxDOT's Environmental Affairs Division. And my job entails uh, working with protected species and uh, conservation of rare and declining resources, um, plant and animal species, uh, 
affected or potentially affected or impacted by TechStop projects or within TechStop right away. And I feel extremely fortunate to live and work in a state as biodiverse as Texas. I um, am passionate about biodiversity, um, both plants and animals, and both of those groups have incredible range of species diversity across the state. And today I'm gonna talk a little bit about identifying rare plants and plant communities uh, within TechStat right away and other places as well. And uh, a little bit about what uh, myself and my group, what we do to protect and conserve these species and these communities. And throughout the, my slides, you'll see different images that I've taken across the state. Uh, most of these are of species that either occur within or adjacent to TechStat right away. So as was, as Sandra covered in the last presentation, you know, TechStat is known for seeding our right of way with wildflowers. However, there are many naturally occurring uh, populations of native species within our right of way, including numerous species that are rare and declining. And I'll just go through the species I've included in this introductory slide. And uh, apologies that I do tend to speak in, in scientific names. I'll include the common name where I know them. There, there are some species I just don't know or either don't have common names or I don't know that common name for it. And uh, a reason why I like to go with scientific names is because each plant has a single scientific name that can identify it from biologists or botanists, plant enthusiasts across the world will know that plant by that name. However, common names, they change region to region. One plant may have several different common names. Um, so common names can be a bit tricky. So one tip, and throughout this presentation, I'll give tips on kind of identifying or learning more about the plants of our area. One of those tips is to try to learn scientific names, or at least um, if you see a plant scientific name, always make an effort to look up the scientific name and uh, don't just rely on common names. So kind of running from left to right across the top of the screen here, that first species is Streptanthus cutleri, which is a member of the mustard family. And that's a really interesting plant that is endemic to a very small area in the Big Bend region of Texas and adjacent northern Mexico. Next to that, we have Trillium texanum, which is the Texas Trillium. It's uh, a very rare Trillium species that occurs in Far East Texas, a few sites in Western uh, Louisiana and a recently discovered population in Southwest um, Arkansas. It occurs in kind of forested seep areas. Next to that, we have the federally endangered Astrophyta mysterious, which is the star cactus. It's endemic to the Tamalipan thorn scrub of South Texas and adjacent uh, Northern Northeastern Mexico. Next to that, we have a lovely orchid, Calipogon oklahomensis the Oklahoma grass pink orchid, which occurs in some of our state's uh, wet native prairies and pine savannas. Next to that, we have Asclepius speciosa. I think that's called the showy milkweed. That is a very large showy milkweed species of the Great Plains in the Intermountain West, which occurs in Texas in a few isolated uh, panhandle populations. And last but not least, we have Hexoelectris warnockiae, the Texas corvid orchid, which is a mycoheterotrophic orchid, meaning it's uh, parasitic on the mycorrhizal fungi that are within plant roots, tree roots, typically oak roots. And it occurs in um, oak and juniper woodlands in central and western portions of the state. To kind of lay the groundwork for this biodiversity and why we have such varied plant communities in the state, I just want to provide some background information on um, kind of the, some of the abiotic factors of Texas that contribute to this. And this map is a classic ecoregions of Texas map, which was developed largely by Frank W. Gould, a uh, work he did in the 60s and 70s. So this shows the typical piney woods, post oak savanna, that, that sort of thing. Um, this is widely used and referenced. And the next slide is the level three ecoregions of Texas, which is a bit more of a refined scale. This is used by Texas Parks and Wildlife in their Texas Conservation Action Plan, which I'll, I'll mention briefly later. Um, and it's also used in their ecological mapping system of Texas, which is was an effort to um, create, uh, generate digital maps of different plant communities throughout the state. 
So you can see this is a bit more refined and it has different uh, names associated with some of these different um, ecoregions. And in general, an ecoregion is a region that has similar biotic and abiotic vectors. So, you know, things um, like climate, soils, plant communities, all of that goes into to, to, uh, delineating an ecoregion. And this map is an EPA ecoregions of the United States. And what's really interesting in this to me is that you can see where we're at in Texas is literally a crossroads for the continental US. So here in East Texas, we're at the far Western range of the Southeastern uh, deciduous and mixed pine hardwood forest province that comes in. Then you move to the West and we're really at the Southern end of this vast uh, prairies and oaks and prairies type province where we have post oak savanna, widely scattered trees intermixed with prairie. You move to central Texas in the panhandle and we're really at the end of, we're at the southern terminus of the Great Plains, although some of that does kind of go down through into Mexico and there's, there's patches of it in West Texas as well. But we're at another kind of terminus for one of these large provinces. And then in West Texas, it's really uh, similar to the desert Southwest and uh, northern Mexico, the Chihuahuan Desert, which is an expansive desert system that reaches its eastern, kind of northeastern limit in Texas. So we have a lot of really interesting things going on in our state. And to highlight some of the reasons for our credible biodiversity, this map is pretty telling. This is uh, a map of the average annual precipitation in Texas. And so if you see, as we move from west to east, we're gaining uh, rainfall across the state. So you can see far west Texas is relatively parched, although you notice there are little pockets of higher levels of rainfall there. And those line up nicely with those, what we call Sky Island mountain ranges. So the Davis Mountains, the Chisos Mountains, the Guadalupe Mountains, all of those that rise, you know, three, four, sometimes 5,000 feet above the surrounding desert. And they really capture moisture from these monsoons in the summer. And so you can have lush forests on top of these mountains <clears throat> and where you have, you know, essentially parched desert below. And as you make your way over to the piney woods of East Texas, you can see rainfall has increased dramatically and it's enough to support cypress tupelo swamps and large, you know, Pine hardwood forest with 100 foot plus tall trees. One very important aspect of being able to locate and identify both plant communities and rare plant species is an understanding of geology. So many species are linked closely to certain um, geologic substrates. So this is a map of the geology of Texas, and you can see there's a lot of variation in our geology. And a lot of these have different sources of parent material. They have vastly different ages. Um, they're really providing the foundation for some of this plant diversity. And understanding the geology of your location will help you to understand what types of rare plants and rare plant communities you might be able to encounter. Being such a large state and having such varied uh, natural regions, Texas has several endemic species. And, and when I say endemic, I'm talking about a species that occurs only in one particular area. So in this case, the three species pictured here only occur within Texas. So Clematis carizoensis, it's um, a Clematis species that is fairly recently described and it's native to these Eocene sand deposits there in Northeast Texas. So it likes these really deep sands. Penstemon triflorus, um, maybe that's called the Hill Country Penstemon, I think, or the Hill Country Beard Tongue. That is one of many species that are endemic to the Edwards Plateau of Texas. So the Edwards Plateau, which includes the Texas Hill Country, is really a, a it's an ecoregion in it, you know, all to Texas. It's something very unique about the state where you have this interesting, lots of limestone, and in the Edwards Plateau, you get bands of limestone and granite occurring in close proximity, which leads to really, if you're driving through the region, you'll see changes in the plant communities, very sharp changes when you change from limestone to granite. Just another kind of that substrate is impacting the plants that are growing there. But 
all the karstic features, um, these lush limestone canyons, numerous springs bubbling up from the Edwards Aquifer create this really unique, these unique ecosystems that have several plants that are found nowhere else on the planet. And Abronia amelia here pictured on the right, that is a sand verbena that only occurs in the South Texas sand sheet. So they're kind of nestled uh, among the Tamalip and Thorn Scrub and all that South Texas brush country, there's this area of deep sands and those deep sands are out of place and they're isolated from other sandy habitats. And as a result, we've had several species evolve there that are unique to just those areas and they occur nowhere else in the state and nowhere else in the world. Another component of our rare flora are these peripheral species. So these are species that are at the edge of range in Texas. They may be common elsewhere within their range, but the, in Texas, they are rare. And so the first one there is Sanguinaria canadensis, or the blood root. This is a spring ephemeral species of the eastern deciduous forests. They flower very early before the trees are able to put, put out leaves. Um, in this way, they're able to capture a lot of that sunlight that penetrates the forest canopy. And um, it's, a, it's a really interesting medicinal plant. It's been has purported medicinal qualities and they're called bloodroot because their roots exude this, this really uh, rich red sap that's been used in toothpastes and for other ailments and things like that. And it's very rare in Texas, but if you go out to the Southern Appalachians or kind of the Eastern deciduous forest, it becomes increasingly common. And as a rule, species tend to be less common on the edges of the range than they are at the centers of the range. Helicactus bicolor is the glory of Texas cactus. And you'll notice this occurs at two peripheral points. So you see on the map below, that's, these are maps of the, the county level dis distribution for these species. And this is a species with the core of its range in Mexico. And if you were to look at its range within Mexico, those two little points, which is kind of that star cactus that, that where you have the Tamalip and Thorn Scrub and Chihuahuan Desert coming together there and over in the Big Bend region, that range would actually be connected through Mexico, but in Texas, they just peak up in those two areas there. I had mentioned Asclepia speciosa, the showy milkweed in, a, in the introductory slide. And you can see there its range, how it's just in a few sites and a few counties in that panhandle, but it has a much broader range across the country and into Canada as well. So why have so many of these plant species and communities become rare? And I'll get into this in detail in the next slide. I'll, I'll cover a couple of the reasons, but one big reason is obviously, I'm just gonna switch back and forth here. Um, some of these species and communities were never common to begin with. So if you're at the edge of range, or if you have like a very isolated geologic formation, or you know a situation where that geology comes close to the surface and creates these unique conditions, those were never common to begin with. Um, and so you can imagine when some of these other factors come into play that it can um, really be detrimental to those species in the state. But the, the big one that's really kind of eliminated a lot of these species or put them into decline is just overall loss of habitat. And there's two ways that habitat can be lost. One is the obvious land clearing and conversion. So these are just some old archival slides of uh, logging operations in the piney woods of East Texas, you know, in the late 1800s, uh, mid to late 1800s, the, the old growth forest in Texas, in East Texas would have rivaled that of anywhere in the country. And by the turn of the century, Texas became one of the largest timber producing regions in the entire nation. And you can see here old growth pine, longleaf pine, old growth shortleaf pine, old growth hardwoods, they were carted out. Once the steam engine came into play, it opened up the, all of East Texas to logging and nearly all of our old growth forest was cut. What exists today are small pockets of old growth forest here and there that were either on private land that did not allow logging or were in areas that were inaccessible to the logging equipment at that time. But a less obvious uh, reason for loss of habitat is changes in disturbance regimes. So this is why I've got the, the American bison on here uh, bison and other animal species greatly impact their environment. They have huge impacts on the plant communities. 
And you can imagine these large nomadic herds of bison moving through and grazing these areas. They kept those areas free of woody plants. They kept vegetation at a certain height and that promoted certain species. Another, you know, another uh, example of a periodic disturbance would be fires, natural fires, lightning ignited fires that would ignite through many of our different uh, plant communities uh, at a regular basis. And that had a similar effect is to keep woody vegetation out, um, to keep vegetation at a certain level and it would pr promote certain species. But we, we know the story of the American bison who was essentially wiped out from Texas and, and the rest of the nation. And we, as European settlers came to live in Texas, we didn't want fire running through our property and destroying our homes. And so fire became, was suppressed in Texas and the rest of the country. And with the, the removal of bison and the suppression of fire and, and other disturbance regimes, plant communities changed. So we didn't destroy them by clearing them or adding development, you know, something like that. They just went through this, the, the process of succession and open grassland habitats grew up into woodlands and things like that nature. So that habitat was lost through that process. And over collection was an issue for certain species. So especially these medicinal species, uh, bloodroot, as I mentioned, settlers came, they were familiar with bloodroot where it was abundant in you know, the Eastern US where, where some of those folks came from and they found it here in Texas and they collected it for whatever medicinal purpose they, um, they might've used it for. And for a species that's not common and uh, you know, a lot of these species are colonial, they have uh, complicated reproduction strategies, they have complicated seed dispersal and, and things you think things like orchids, which are very attractive to collectors and, and they're often collected in large numbers. Orchids depend on very complex relationships with fungi in the soil. And so it's very hard for new populations to, of orchids to become established. So you start to take them out at a, at a rate greater than you can replace them. So these are some of the reasons why a lot of these plant communities are rare today. And just some of the way that we uh, identify, delineate rare plants. Um, this, these two links I provided here, the Texas Conservation Action Plan, it's an parks and wildlife plan that addresses rare and declining species and kind of uh, different poli policies and ideas for their management. And within this plan is a list of species of greatest conservation need. Um, and these are divided up across taxa. So you have plants and you have different animal groups and things like that. And these are species that are essentially, they're considered to be rare and declining. And to figure out how or, or what makes a rare species, there's a nonprofit conservation organization called NatureServe that has developed this methodology for ranking a species based on its um, population status. And so to go into this process, um, you know, oftentimes you'll have experts in a particular subject field, so for, for a certain group of plants or something like that. And they look at things like known populations, available habitat, you know, th external threats and things like that, and they develop this ranking number. And it's assigned a value from one to five. And you can see here, so these G, like where it says, a one, that's globally. So that's their global level. So a G1 species is globally critically imperiled. And then you have S1, that's the state level. So S1 in Texas, an S1 species would be critically imperiled in Texas. It could be common elsewhere, but it's critically imperiled in Texas. And sometimes you see this S1, S2, uh, the exact population size is not necessarily known, but it's suspected to be in between one of those features. And some species just are not ranked. So you'll see SNR sometimes. And T1 is a subspecies rank. But generally, rare species are these species that are S1 to S3. So a, a lot of different groups consider those. That's kind of the cutoff for a species to be considered a rare species is S3. Of course, this is all highly subjective. Um, so it's, it's not an exact science, but that's a good starting point. And obviously the S1 and the S2, those are the, the, the really rare species and S3 are potentially declining species or species that are at risk of becoming imperiled. 
in Texas, uh, there are give or take 31 species of federally listed species. So these are species that are protected under the Endangered Species Act. Um, we work with several of these species, and there are just a few uh, for you to, to see here. Abronia macrocarpa, which is the large fruited sand verbena, it occurs in, I think, three counties in the post oak savanna of Texas. Uh, we have again Astrophyta mysterious, it's a federally endangered species uh, that's South Texas star cactus. And then uh, Lusquerella pallida, or the white bladder pod, is known only from San Augustine County, Texas. So this occurs in only one county in Texas, and it occurs in these. Uh, outcrops or glades where the weeches formation comes close to the surface and there's some very specific kind of conditions that it requires. And so why roadsides? You know, why, why, why discuss rare plants and roadsides? And the reason is that roadsides have become one of the last refuges for several of these species. And I'll get into why in a moment. But I just want to give the example, um, Physis digital Physostegia longicepala is one of the false dragon heads. It's a, it's a mint, it's a really pretty species, and this particular species is found only in Southeast Texas and adjacent Western Louisiana. And today, essentially, this species has been relegated to the roadside. So that part of Texas used to be expansive wet longleaf pine savanna. It was open, and that's where many of these species occurred. But that habitat has essentially been eliminated and it's been developed, it's been turned into pine plantation, all of these things, fire has been removed. So the roadsides have become a refuge because they're the only areas that are, are essentially mimic what that historic habitat type would have been like with increased moisture and disturbance through mowing and things like that. So that's really the only place you see these are on the roadside right away is connected areas. Um, Echinacea atrorubens, which is the Topeka purple coneflower, is a, a species kind of of the, the southern central Great Plains, and it's uh, considered rare in Texas, and it occurs uh, in several, you know, roadside populations, and oftentimes you'll see it in the roadside, but not in adjacent um, pasture land or whatever that property may be. And then Ariocarpus fisheratus is not, it's, that's the living rock cactus, it's not necessarily rare per se in Texas. It's just an interesting species of West Texas. It's a spineless cactus. Um, it's essentially invisible for, for most of the year, but it does bloom uh, in the fall and puts out these beautiful pink blooms. And that is a species that also occurs in our right of way, as do several other imperiled cactus species. And so some of the reasons why these roadsides provide such good habitat for wildflowers, including these rare plants, is that you have, uh, you often have increased water availability there um, adjacent to the roadway. You have uh, oftentimes protection from development. So across the, the million plus acres of right of way throughout the state, most of those are protected in a year by year basis from development. And you have this regular disturbance regime introduced through our mowing program. So what that mowing does is it mimics that periodic grazing by American bison, that periodic fire, and allows these disturbance-dependent disturbance dependent plants, which are typically our rarest of species, to persist in that area because of that. And I just want to give a few uh, tips, ideas for identifying rare plants and plant communities. Obviously, with with uh, hundreds and hundreds of these species in Texas, it, it wouldn't make much sense to go through a species by species uh, identification lesson, but I wanna give some ideas on how you could identify a plant that you're looking at or how you can possibly identify when you might have a rare plant community or even tips for going on and, and looking for these things. And so here you've got a, a longleaf pine savanna with uh, prairie blazing star in the understory. Just a really nice example of what longleaf pine savannas used to look like, and this is on a property that's managed by uh, periodic prescribed fire and growing season fire too, which is an important element too, because that mimics when a lot of these lightning igniting ignited fires would have burned through. And first and foremost, when you're out looking for plants is safety first. So, so make sure you're only stopping and looking in areas where it is both legal and safe to do so. And what I like to do and what I've always done is I look for something that looks out of place. 
So, you know, you may, you may not know what you're looking at, but you, you're looking at the roadside and you see typical fields of blue bonnets or paintbrushes or some familiar plant. And then you see one little pocket, you know, of this plant that just looks different. Or there's a few different plants there. Something just looks different. Um, that's, worth take, that's worth taking a look at because oftentimes that means that there's some special soil condition or something like that there. Um, and it can um, really lead to some interesting discoveries. Also, if you're trying to find rare plants, oftentimes a rare plant may be hard to see or find enough of itself. They may only be, there may only be a few individuals in that area. They may be cryptic or hard to see. But if you look for indicator species, that can narrow down uh, where to look. And there are, there are resources. So if there's a plant of interest that you're interested in, a certain species you want to see, read the literature on that plant. And it um, will often, you'll often be able to find different indicator species that are more common and easier to identify. So if you're out and you see a number of these indicator species together, you know, that's a good place to stop and look for this particular plant species. And always look for clues in the soil and geology. And so, you know, where you're stopped, you'll notice if you're in a generally clayey area and all of a sudden there's this pocket of deep sand, the plants change. So understanding relationships between plants and soil, so knowing the types of soil that some of these rare plants prefer will help you to be able to identify where to look for them. So if you see, like in East Texas here, um, these, we call them xeric sand hills or these, these deep sand communities have a lot of really interesting endemic plant species. And uh, anytime I see, you know, a uh, certain species that I know occurs in these deep sand habitats, I'll stop, I'll take a look, I'll look around for something interesting. And, you know, similarly, like if you, you know, there's certain geology, so if you're, you're see like a granite outcrop in a larger area of limestone, you might know there's something interesting to look for there. You can see a certain geologic features close to the surface or, or you know, cuts or things like that where there's exposed, um, there's exposed rock or there's exposed geologic formations. Those are often good areas to look. Um, always carefully examine the plant. Um, uh, obviously there's a safety plug here to, to know the plants that can potentially hurt or irritate you. So, so know how to identify poison ivy. Know, you know, if you don't know what, if you, you're not confident that you're looking at a plant that is not toxic or can potentially cause a rash, do not touch it. But if you are, you know, somewhat familiar with the plant or the genus of the plant, you want to look at lots of different elements. So you want to look at the upper side of flowers, underside of flowers, the leaves, upper side of leaves, underside of leaves. How are the leaves arranged on the stem? Are they opposite each other? Are they alternate? Um, what is the shape of the leaves? What does the stem look like? What's the shape of the stem? Are there hairs? Is it smooth? There's all different things to look for. And you want to, it's always a good idea if you're not sure what plant you're looking at to have like a field notebook or something um, where you can record some of these characteristics to be able to look at later to identify them. Take many pictures. So take as many pictures as you can of these different parts of the plant. Um, and then that can help you later if you're consulting references or things like that, you know, you can have those images to, to go back on. And if you're good at art, I always say draw. I mean, if you're, if, you're, if you're an artist or if you're someone who likes that, look at whatever plant you're looking at and make a detailed drawing of it. But do not collect a specimen. Um, don't make a, a voucher or take something back with you because oftentimes if these are rare plants, you know, they may only be occurring in a few areas. They could theoretically be a plant that is protected either by state or federal law. So it's always a good time. It's always, you know, a good idea just to look, take pictures, but don't actually collect the plants. Some helpful resources for um, identifying or, or, you know, identifying or understanding these rare plants and plant communities are listed here. The first link is the Biota of North America project. And if you recall some of my previous slides, there were some county level distribution maps. Um, that's all from this resource. So this has uh, that link there it goes through all the, these different plant genera and it has most of the genera in our state. And you could search for that genus and it'll pull up maps of every species known to occur of that genus. Or, or there are a few missing, but it has most of them. And you could look, so you say you might know you have something in a particular genus, you just don't know the species. You could go through that list and see which ones occur in your area and help narrow it down. Um, that plants.usda.gov is a similar resource. It has some basic information on a lot of these plants and um, some range maps as well. 
eFloras.org is a good site. It has some keys, dichotomous keys. It has uh, very detailed descriptions of many of these species, and it provides some information on them there. Um, the Web Soil Survey is the NRCS tool that uh, helps. You could select a target area, and it'll tell you about the soils of that area. And then wildflower.org, that's the uh, Wildflower Center's page, and that just provides a lot of good information on different species. And so I kind of want to close out on some of the things that, that uh, my group does and that TxDOT uh, maintenance groups do and that district staff do, do to preserve and uh, to protect and conserve these rare plants and plant communities. And a big part of that is just figuring out where they're at. So identifying where they're at and mapping them so that we know where these communities are in our right of way. And we do work with partners like Texas Parks and Wildlife, the Native Plant Society of Texas, um, groups like that. Um, but you know, we have a daunting task of a million plus acres of right of way stretched over a huge state. So there are areas that we're just not aware of. So the more of those that we can identify, map, and target, uh, the better. And one thing that we, you know, knowing where these are, if there is a construction project in that area, if feasible or if, if possible, we'll try to protect those areas. So we'll try to put up fencing around those areas to keep uh, equipment out of them and things like that. Um, after a project's done, or if it's, if it's an area where there's not an active project, but there's an active mowing, we might put up these restricted activity signs. Um, we used to put up no mow signs, and, and my personal preference is to move away from no mow because a lot of these sites do need some mowing, but there's just a, maybe a change to the mowing regime. And oftentimes we can implement a management schedule, so mowing, herbicide, whatever it might be, a schedule based on a particular ecology of either a species or, or a plant community. And so, you know, the thing is, the thing to remember is that no matter when we mow, we're going to impact a certain species. So most of these areas have wildflowers that bloom throughout the year. And so, you know, if we have a rare or target species in that area, adapting a mowing schedule to help promote that species might be appropriate. But otherwise, I mean, in general, it's hard to do that because any time that you mow, you're going to somehow affect, you know, if you mow later in the spring, you're going to have a negative impact on those summer blooming flowers that are just coming up and things like that. So that, that, that's a tricky topic, but if we have a rare plant or a rare plant community, we can really target that and for that smaller area and try to mow based on that species needs. We monitor our populations of, of these rare plants where we know they occur when we're, when we're able. We'll go out and look at population from year to year, see how they're doing, see if there's been any kind of a decline or if there's any kind of a threat, a new threat that we've noticed. And there are times when a construction project will impact some of these communities and it's, it's unavoidable. In those cases, we work with partners to try to collect seed um, and if possible and appropriate to translocate individual plants from that particular site. And I wanna thank you all for, for joining us today and for letting me talk for a while. And I'm gonna see here if I can pass it over to Travis. Thank you all. Good morning. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good morning. My name is Travis Jez. I am with the maintenance division of TxDOT and I'm going to talk to you all uh, briefly about um, what uh, kind of what we're doing and, and uh, kind of our motto of what we fall, uh, fall, follow, excuse me. And um, I'm with the maintenance division, specifically the maintenance field support section. And our position is to um, reach out to the districts uh, when they need some help uh, with various things in this situation, specifically uh, wildflowers and grass planting, um, erosion control, things of that sort. So I won't take up too much of y'all's time today, but I do wanna to talk to y'all about uh, where we are and where we're going. I do have a couple of slides here, uh, just to kind of recap on uh, Sandra's um, presentation. That was uh, very, very, uh, it was a very good presentation as well as Matt's. Uh, what's interesting here is we all have an overlap in um, within TechStop in what we, uh, what we do on a daily occasion and uh, within the different divisions. So, like Sandra was talking a little bit about earlier, but uh, I'll just say, you know, back in 37 uh, ish, uh, there was a memorandum put out that says don't mow until wildfires have, have gone to seed. Uh, we take that to heart. We do our best to uh, to to work with that um, that uh, that motto. Um, and um, and so 
uh, we'll kind of talk about that as we move forward here. So, so over the years, you know, with, with the maintenance division, uh, of course, we're, we're, we are uh, tasked to take care of the, the right of way once it's built uh, long term. And that's, uh, you know, we work towards enhancing the beautification of the right of way. And uh, we've been doing that for a lot of years. And the objective there is to continually preserve our right of way by practicing uh, proper mowing and um, any type of herbicide treatment that needs to be done uh, for invasive species. And um, so um, it's a really interesting job. There's a lot of moving parts at all times, um, as you as you can um, can imagine. And we'll talk about our acreage here in just a moment. So a little bit about our mowing and, and kind of what we what we're what we're working with. And it's a critical part of keeping the right of way beautiful, uh, you know, beautiful and healthy. Kind of like what Matt was saying. Some of our our plants they they need that that uh, that mowing option. Uh, you know. We always want the, the wildflowers to set seed before we mow. Uh, we might not be able to allow all of them to set seed, but the, the majority of them is our are really our game plan. Uh, we have to start mowing at some point, and uh, that way we can finish before the rainy season and we don't run up the right of way and, and we can get through with that. So, um, you know, mowing also reduces the cool season um, component and allows the warm season grass to establish um, in the spring. That's our fall mowing. Uh, we try and stick around that uh, seven inches minimum. Um, on our height, our perennials, uh, so that they'll uh, flourish in the sun's full range, um, as well as, uh, you know, mowing the, the, the milkweed no more than seven inches uh, lower. Um, um, that way it has time to come back and bloom. Um, I do want to make a comment here. You know, I spend a lot of time traveling. We travel um, quite a bit, roughly 75 or 80 percent um, on an average year. We haven't had that in a couple of years, but on an average year. And I will say that this year um, in my area, the milkweed has done extremely well um, in response to the mowing. Um, we've had more milkweed than we've ever seen. And um, a lot of that is because we were able to, um, to, um, uh, to, to maintain that right away properly. Uh, we do have some non-mow areas. Um, I know some people call them no-mows, but non-mow areas. Uh, this, these also help establish the fall pollinator habitat. Uh, they're usually off the right away. We sometimes have to go in and maintain those areas over a course of several years. Not every year they, they get maintained. Uh, that will be uh, could be because of the, uh, the overgrowth or if we have an invasive species in there or if it's being taken over by some type of uh, uh, woody species that we don't want in that area. So again, since uh, 32, you know, we've been working really hard with our native uh, wildflowers and grasses and Something to bear in mind, and you and you've heard you'll hear it many, many times, and that is that the uh, the we have a um, we have about eight hundred thousand uh, manageable acres. It's, uh, there'll be a slide here a little bit later and talk about one point two million total, but eight hundred thousand manageable acres, and that's a lot of acres. Um, and so we sow that roughly. You, everybody hears that thirty thousand uh, pound mark. Now that fluctuates. Um, it fluctuates sometimes uh, quite a bit throughout the years, depending on availability of seed, bulk seed, and there is our fifteen thousand acres of our right of way uh, that we uh, we seed approximately. Now this past year, um, I think it was like sixteen two. Um, again, it fluctuates year to year depending on our uh, construction that we might have going on or. Um, you know, different different things of the funding of, of getting the seed and things of that sort. So of that, the native grasses and wildflowers, they help obviously, you know, we they help with our pollinators, uh, the habitat for wildlife, the water conservation and erosion control. Uh, these all play hand in hand and, and going kind of from what Sandra was talking about with the erosion control and Matt with the some of the habitat for the plants themselves. But a lot of times people uh, forget about the uh, the wildlife and uh, not necessarily talking about like deer or hogs or something of that sort, but uh, nesting birds and uh, and other other uh, other things out there, the snakes and uh, the different types of bugs that are available. So in doing all this, we're protecting to preserve uh, these investments and uh, you know we really work for the integrated vegetation management. And I think what's important, we were talking about it the other day as well, and I think what's important is is we look at um, you know, the overall objective uh, in our book, would, we'd love to get back to a regenerative type of uh, right of way. That way it would uh, be able to be self sustainable. And um, as long as we can stick with shorter varieties of, of uh, grasses and such in the main areas, which is roughly, roughly 15 foot out from the edge of, uh, edge of road, um, 
then, you know, if we can get that and we can get our invasive species under control, then we get into a revegeta uh, uh, regenerative type of uh, area of agriculture, if you will. So we'll kind of move forward. And um, so textile mowing practices encourage and supports pollinator habitat by delaying the mowing to ensure wildlife, uh, excuse me, wildflower uh, seed um, has um, done its due diligence. And um, we delay it as, as long as we can. Uh, we do have to get in there and uh, most of our mowing is, is done uh, specifically for safety. Um, I know if my family's traveling down the road or maybe yours as well, um, and they need to pull off of the road for an emergency or, or what have you, that uh, they're able to see what's there and they're able to pull off the road. The other question is, um, you know, um, what about the, the wildlife that might, might be in that tall vegetation? Well, that's another reason that we, we keep it uh, mowed back um, in specific times of year uh, for the um, larger wildlife, such as the deer. So, again, we do have our non-mow areas for wildlife hab uh, habitat establishment preservation. And TxDOT districts have a vegetation manager, if, uh, if, if you all are not familiar with this. And our vegetation manager, each district has one, and that vegetation manager is tasked with uh, the veget all the vegetation work. And they, they oversee, uh, you know, different applications and the, and the proper applications, if it be the uh, timely of the, the herbicide treatment or maybe even the mowing treatment. So, uh, you know, they, uh, they're very versed in what they're doing and uh, we are here to help them as well when they have questions. So the last bullet there, by establishing sustainable uh, vegetation, or we could say, uh, you know, regenerative vegetation, uh, management programs that specifically address wildflower preservation and protection, TxDOT has maintained biodiversity while reducing and mowing maintenance costs. Y'all must, y'all need to, uh, there, there's an interesting thing here is in, in 800,000 acres of to mow is quite a few acres. I mean, it's extremely expensive to do that uh, with uh, going through there twice a year. Something I'd like to touch base on though uh, with that, uh, going back on what I was talking about, and that is, if we can build a habitat in our right of way uh, that is productive and um, can take care of itself, that lessens our mowing. So a little bit about our education and outreach. Um, this, we do uh, a, a lot of this. I, I'm a firm believer that uh, outreach and obviously the education part, the more we can talk about what we do and why we do it and the benefits overall of what we're doing um, if it be the pollinator gardens, which we'll talk about, the Monarch Highway, we'll talk about here in just a minute. There's a couple slides on it. Um, one voice uh, can be heard if talking to one person and that one person is able to continually, um, continually talk to others. Um, we've, we've done our, our due diligence and we've done very well. And um, so word of mouth goes a long way. So, some of our outreach is in our safety rest areas. Here we have roughly 12 uh, tribal information centers and roughly 80 safety rest areas. I welcome you if you haven't stopped in those in the last 20 years, please take the time and do this. Um, they are very, very nice and have come a long way. So along with our Monarch Highway, uh, we do this, the, you know, we're part of the Monarch Highway system to promote public awareness of the, the Monarch butterfly, um, the honeybee and pollinator uh, conservation. And I'll stop right there for just a moment. And the Monarch has really opened up a lot of avenues for a lot of people. And I think that's a, a very positive thing, but ultimately TxDOT is about all pollinators. If we manage for all pollinators in our right away, we will take care of other, um, other butterflies, other bugs, other bees, everything of that sort. So when we manage overall, um, everybody uh, prospers. So, uh, the uh, pollinator conservation, as well as the central fly flyway um, and migratory path, obviously the I-35 I corridor is kind of the, the one that's um, that's going about on that. Um, organizes, we organize educational material, lots of education material, lots of outreach, kind of like what we're doing here today. Um, and I'm speaking with y'all. And then the pollinator friendly seed mixes. And so uh, part of one of my tasks is to work with the, the um, the seed mixes and find out what's uh, what's uh, commercially available and possibly what could go into certain districts uh, when a district calls and says and will ask, hey, you know, you have a suggestion on what you might want to put in our district or what we could put in our district, I should say. 
So a little bit, a little bit more about where we are, you know, back in 15, uh, tech stock facility cooperation agreement with US Fish and Wildlife, as far as well as with uh, Texas uh, Plant Society, Native Plant Society of Texas, excuse me. Um, in some of our rest areas, we put in these pollinator gardens, and I'll just kind of go through a little bit about this, but uh, they provide resources, resources. And, and the main thing, again, I'll go back to is the educational resources, because that speaks volumes but as well as some habitat for possibly uh, the monarch or other pollinators that might be coming through. So each area includes educational signage, opportunities for traveling public, um, and to engage in monarch conservation. Um, some of these areas um, are, we, we rework some of these areas or the safety rest area uh, folk did, they rework these areas uh, for proper drainage and um, they're able to get in some, some really good pollinator um, habitat. So, uh, that being said, the uh, Hillsboro rest area up on I-35, Bell County rest area, we have other we have others, and we're slowly working on those. Some of our other rest areas just have pollinator areas that we planted uh, out and back. Sometimes you'll see those in the spring, um, not necessarily with the signage and such. Keep an eye out on that when you're at a rest area, kind of wander out, uh, not in traffic area, obviously, but uh, just kind of wander through some of the uh, the walking paths, and you might see some of the areas that we planted. I always like this picture. Some of you might have seen it before, but uh, several years ago we were traveling through Hardeman County and stopped at the safety rest area and we wandered down through. Uh, there's a, a pond or a tank down in the down uh, down on the bottom there and uh, the trees were full of all, all the monarchs. It was really pretty and it was really nice. And this was obviously a southern migration. So TechStot, we've we've partnered with uh, multiple universities to look at our seed development, uh, specifically that started off as the grass uh, grasses and what we're planting in our right of way um, has rolled over into um, some of our uh, forbs and, and some of our native wildflowers. Uh, but the take home here is this work has resulted in roughly 41 new native seed mix varieties. And right now we're working on our rural seeding, um, seeding uh, varieties and uh, we are looking at um, of changing some of this up and adding some additional um, native grasses into our rural seeding areas. Um, and you more than welcome to look into that. It's um, so as part of the research seeding specifications, again, two thirds of our tech dots, 25 districts have changed. Uh, we look to add to that this year for our new specification that'll come out in a few years and um, we'll have more varieties of our native grasses. So we'll continue as tech dot, we'll continue to foster collaboration uh, partnership with entities uh, focusing, uh, providing habitat for pollinators. Of course, our outreach, uh, propagate, uh, you know, growing uh, more native seed along the highway and uh, making sure that we really get um, uh, get the, the most natives we can out in our right of way as quickly as possible. So a little bit about um, a little bit about our training. We have about 1,300 uh, operators um, in the state that we deal with on any given year. Uh, they go through a mandatory training. It's an annual training. We uh, train them in vegetation and wildflower identification, uh, timing of herbicides and applications of the herbicides, um, when not to spray, when to spray, um, and things of that sort. Uh, we move forward on that with supporting the districts through informational pamphlets. Uh, development um, and uh, wildflower guides. The important, uh, importance of the pollinator plants, uh, why we need them, again, that kind of rolls back into uh, what Matt was talking about and uh, taking care of our right away to do the best we can with what we have to work with. Uh, again, we talk to them about the seed mixes and uh, we go through meetings with them annually, biannually. So kind of, kind of an interesting um, uh, movement. Um, kind of where we're going, and I'm going to talk about a little bit about CCAA. I'm not going to touch on it too much, but just to kind of give you a really quick brief overview. CCAA is the uh, Monarch Candidate uh, Conservation Agreement with Assurances. And what this is, is it's a collaboration that TechSot's taken a step forward. We've taken uh, the first foot uh, forward of many states and uh, doing what we do. And what it does is we work with U.S. Fish and Wildlife and being part of this, this group um, give, provides us regulatory assurances to, to the participants. And what it does is it kind of, we work with, with U.S. Fish and Wildlife and others and saying, look, th these are our practices. This is what we are doing uh, in the event that um, 
something might, a, a butterfly or a endangered species might be there, uh, that we're already, we're, we already have a foot forward in working with them and saying, hey, you know, this is what we're doing. They're, they're looking at our, our practices and approving our practices for what we are doing right now. So it promotes the conservation of the monarch butterfly, uh, the conservation measures and supplementary measures um, if needed. So we went ahead and enrolled 100% of our land, which we didn't have to do, but we did, which is roughly 1.2 million acres of that. Uh, we, we really take a look at the 446,000 plus acres that we adopted in and uh, there's ways we look at that with uh, running plots throughout the state uh, a couple of times a year, once a year, depending on how it's set up for that time. Um, so adopted acres are where uh, conservation me measures are pledged. Those acres move around a little bit. Uh, of those measures, things that are looked at is the, the timing of the mowing, the limiting the mowing, the targeting of the uh, specific use of herbicide and the non-mow areas. And uh, of course the paved services and non-habitat are not included. So I'm going to talk just real briefly about the green ribbon, and this is actually a landscape um, division uh, program, but it's allowed the maintenance side to really um, propel uh, the use of wallflowers. And what it is, is it's a percentage of the construction cost from non-attainment and near non-attainment districts goes towards beautification. Um, again, there's, a, there's overlap between uh, different divisions, one of which uh, that we overlap with is landscape and they ask us on a regular occasion to help them with wildflower plantings along the highway and things of that sort. And so we are very happy and very proud to be able to help them and assist them in the green ribbon projects. So my uh, presentation's uh, a little bit shorter than everybody else's and I, I just really want to, um, to, to end this with a hashtag that I hope that uh, everybody will remember and and, one, and what it comes down to is fall for flowers and fall for flowers is very, very important to us. And, uh, you know, we, we sat down and we were trying to think of something that would really catch somebody's eye or their ear and fall for flowers and what it means to us. And what it means to us basically is fall is the time to plant flowers and uh, now it's time to fall for them and, and let's get them in the ground and let's move forward and uh, wait till the springtime when they come up uh, real pretty in the spring. And so many, so many times we get a phone calls in the springtime about, hey, I want to plant wildflowers and that's great, but uh, we really need to look at the fall time to get those in the ground. So I appreciate y'all today. And if y'all have any questions, I think that some have already popped up. I guess we'll be here to answer. Thank y'all very much. Jennifer, you might be muted. We can't hear you. Yes, there we go. Okay, is that better? Yes, thank you. Too many buttons on all these machines. Um, thank you, everybody, again. Thank you, Travis. Thank you, all of our presenters. Uh, we do have a ton of questions, so we're going to do our best to answer as many as possible. Um, if the panelists would like to turn on their cameras, just so I can ask you questions and you can answer them right away. I think we're going to start with um, an easy question. I'm going to pitch it to Matt first. How far south do blue bonnets grow? You had some great maps, so that might. So the the interesting thing about blue bonnets is that what what, what was once you know the, the state flower is actually nine or so different species. So uh, blue bonnets typically was considered lupinus the genus. Um, so, you know, the, the most familiar are the Lupinus texensis, which is the um, Texas blue bonnet, and then Lupinus subcarnosis, which is the um, Sandy Lands blue bonnet. Those are the two typical blue bonnets, but we have several other species that are native to different parts of the state, including a species that's restricted to the Big Bend region. We have uh, a couple of species that are very rare in the Panhandle, the East Texas species. Um, so, really, in Texas, they can grow pretty much throughout the state, um, except for a lot, you know, a large part of West Texas and the Panhandle, they're absent. But down in South Texas, you have lupin and subcarnosis, the Sandyland blue bonnet, and some of that sandy habitat and areas like that. So 
they can grow all the way down basically to the southern tip of Texas. Cool. Okay. Calls for a road trip then in the spring. Get get across the whole state. Um, question for you, Sandra. Um, do you or do you already aware of? You showed us some great historical books about wildflowers and different species. Are there any more current publications about wildflowers along roadsides and the history of the program that you're aware of? Oh gosh, um, <laughs> pop quiz. <laughs> you can think about it, and you can put uh, it in the chat later. Yeah, why don't I do that? Because there okay. are uh, a couple really good ones. Uh, yeah, I'll do that. Okay, and then we had a follow another question for you, Sandra, about just terminology. Um, uh, is it a bar ditch or a barrow ditch? People have <laughs> have argued that point for years. Um, it can be either one. Uh, it is referred to as a bar ditch, and it can also be referred as a barrow ditch. We uh, do have borrow pits, for instance, um, that we um, in textile on in um, building our highways where we um, take dirt out uh, and it's called a borrow pit. Um, a bar ditch um, is, is, you know, it's supposedly, I guess, way back when it kind of kept the cattle out of, that's one uh, version of it. It kept the cattle from uh, getting on the roadside or discouraged them from it and the same uh, and since we use cattle guards today, for instance, it would discourage them. So some people say that's why it's bar, but borrow is taking dirt out of an area and using it somewhere else. Okay. All right. Very good. See, okay. Um, let's see <laughs> things. I didn't know I would need to know working at TechDot, right? <laughs> um, Travis, a question for you. Um, what is the process of gathering the wildflower and native grasses seeds that you guys plant along the roadsides? So we purchase the wildflower and native grass seed. We do not gather it in the right of way. Uh, we we purchase that from uh, seed seed companies. Okay, um, and in um, we had some questions on grasses. Are there any old world grasses in the mix, or do we prefer native grasses? Um, all of our that I can think of off the top of my head right now, just the native grasses. Okay. Okay. Let's see. Um, and then out to the group, are there any laws today about roadside flower gathering that you're aware of? What's the best practice? I guess we kind of went over this, but maybe just to reemphasize what the best practices are. Just don't pick them. Is that so, kind of. <laughs> well, I, I would say. I mean, there are laws that protect protected species, and if you don't know what species is a protected species, then um, it, it's probably a good idea not not to pick the flowers. Um, and just in general, I think practice wise, um, the, the more flowers that are picked, especially with species that they might look like they're common in that area, but they may be uncommon elsewhere. Um, so overall, I mean, just just observing them where they're at is, is I would recommend. And that ensures you're not breaking any laws or anything like that. Sure, good call. Um, all right, let's see. We've had a lot of questions about invasive species um, and how we manage those. I don't know if Travis or Matt, you want to take a stab at uh, what things TechSot's doing to help manage and combat the invasive species. I'll I'll start with one, if you don't mind, Matt, real quick. Um, I, Probably our biggest invasive species overall in our right of way is Johnson grass. Um, we do use a uh, selective herbicides for Johnson grass, and um, it's very important in spraying that and uh, managing that. And uh, the better we manage that, the more so the native grasses will come in. And, and so that's just one thing's happening. Yeah, selective herbicides are, are a big part of it, but there's also um, in different contracts, so mowing contracts and uh, like if you have a construction project in the in those plant sets that go out, there's often language about cleaning uh, equipment in a certain way that ensures that any potential seeds that might be carried from site to site or that may be there on the, the machine are washed away. So that really, you know, a lot of these, these plants are 
invasive plants are established in our right of way in an uphill battle, but this helps to prevent their continued spread and their continued establishment, chipping away at them with selective management. Certain you know, introducing mowing at a certain time can help with certain things and those selective herbicides. Over time, it, it, you just hope that we can chip away at it. I mean, it's the it's the issue facing all disciplines of natural resource management throughout the country, and it's something that we do actively work at trying to reduce native species in our right of ways. Great. Um, question for you, Travis. Where can um, can people buy the seed mixes that TechSot uses? Are they publicly available? Yes, so what I would suggest is it's called item 164 for TechSot, and that is our grass spec. Um, and you can see there, I know I thought I saw, I, I'll answer one of the other questions that popped up a minute ago too, the native grasses for North Texas. You go to item 164, it breaks it down per district, and um, it'll tell you what those mixes are, and then you can call the seed companies and see what they do and do have available. Cool. All right, question um, for you, Matt. You were talking a little bit earlier in your presentation about different factors that disturb wildflower and native species. Um, do wind, fine, wind farm turbine plants, um, do they have any impact on wildflower growth or environments? You know, I don't, I don't know how qualified I am to speak to that, just not being, you know, it's not something we work with, but I, I think any, any activity like that where you're, you know, it's not just the turbine itself. You have to have a certain area of clearing around the turbine. You have to put in access to the turbine like that. I mean, any, any activity like that is going to disturb plants, but that doesn't mean that there's not ways that similar to what we've been able to do that you can, uh, those entities can implement conservation activities within there to help promote native plants and, and help protect rare species, rare communities, and things like that. Um, so, I mean, I, I would say just just like any land use that's different from the original condition of the land, it's going to have an impact for sure. Okay, great. Um, question for you, Travis. How can someone get a section of roadside in their county designated as a reduced mowing area? Um, is that need to, possible? To yeah, depending, I, I'm not gonna say it's pot. I, I don't know because, uh, like I said, I'm field support. Um, but what you'll need to do is contact your local maintenance section, text stop maintenance section, and uh, start the discussion there. And uh, then if they have any questions, uh, they will, they, that conversation can be between that person and that, and that maintenance section. Okay, great. I would, I would put a plug in for district environmental staff too, or, you know, when you know, because we, we've had that native plant society of Texas has come to us with certain locations that we've looked into. And and determined that they really do warrant a, a restricted management or, or a modified management regime, but that's a district by district decision. Um, so that's something that that district maintenance staff environmental staff and, and you know, their supervisory staff are going to determine, but yeah, contact your district for sure. I would agree. Yeah, that's a good place to start for lots of these questions that we're getting. Um, so don't be afraid to reach out to us at TechStop for sure. Um, another question here, more about partnerships. So the Native Plant Society has demonstration gardens with educational signage at two rest stops along I-35. Are any of you aware of partnerships like this to help increase demonstration gardens throughout the state? I am not. Okay. But again, a good opportunity to reach out to your district, perhaps, or, or, you know, engage with them to discuss potential opportunities to develop more of those demonstration areas. Okay, let's see. So many questions, you guys. This is awesome. I'm just trying to keep up here. So, so bear with me. <laughs> okay, question for you, Travis. Can you talk a little bit more about the green ribbon program and who is eligible, how to apply, et cetera? So I'm going to have to defer that um, over to landscape. It's landscape uh, takes care of the green ribbon um, project. Um, I just help and uh, with uh, seeding. Um, so I'll have to defer that to uh, Sandra, I guess. <laughs> yeah, the green ribbon program is a type of funding um, that is only it's restricted to just uh, planting and and items related to planting. So planting beds, um, maybe a temporary irrigation system, only temporary for the planting. 
and uh, the plant materials, the soils, and maybe, for instance, the concrete around that area. And then we've also recently incorporated more its use in uh, wildflower seeding and revegetation uh, that way or overseeding uh, with wildflower seeds. Um, the green ribbon money is um, allocated by the legislature and it goes to specific uh, districts uh, because certain counties in those districts have a certain type of air quality. And it is based on the percentage of construction uh, funds for highways that were spent, for instance, in that particular year. So it's a certain percentage has to go to uh, replanting and revegetating, essentially, um, with trying to reforest, essentially. So, um, like I mentioned, we recently started using that more and more on wildflowers. And um, what you need to do is really contact your local district to talk about that, of what, whether that particular district, <clears throat> excuse me, even has funds available. Because some districts don't have the air quality, <clears throat> excuse me, air quality issues, and so therefore they don't get this funding at all. And uh, the, some districts have quite a bit of that funding, uh, but it's mostly an urban area, so uh, there are not that many locations to necessarily do wildfire seeding. Uh, we um, have, so it's not really an application process. That's that's the main point I'd like to make on that. We are doing a number of projects, for instance, um, so wildflower seeding in uh, the Athens area around the uh, intersections of the Loop 7 around Athens in Henderson County, which is in uh, the Tyler district. Um, and that's going on pretty much in the next month or so. We've got something in uh, Nueces County, uh, just outside of Corpus, uh, where we're doing a number of major intersections there, and also in Ranzas County um, in some um, kind of critical areas, but in, in some intersections or entrances, for instance, to, um, to the county. So, uh, and we've done quite a bit around the Austin area and San Antonio and all over the state. So, uh, contact your district or your area office and see if those funds are available in your district. And if they haven't programmed them yet, uh, they usually contact us and talk to us about it. Um, because we at the landscape um, section of the design division um, will throw together um, uh, plans that can go out to bid for construction. We also have um, in some of our districts that where we have landscape architects, those landscape architects will arrange with um, the maintenance people in the district to, in some instances, they buy seed directly through this program, the Green Ribbon Money, and the maintenance, uh, maintenance staff distributes and spreads the seeds at the proper time. Great. All right, I've got another question here. Um, again, Travis, can you give us a little bit more information about TechSpot's mowing schedule? Um, like how often they do it, what time of year they do it, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So our um, summer mow will be uh, doesn't start till after June one, roughly, um, or when wildflowers have set seed. And our fall mowing starts around uh, some of the state. I think this year has been a little bit different because of the amount of rain that we've had uh, throughout the entire state. Our fall mowing uh, would be around the Octoberish thereabouts. It just depends on the district, the amount of they have and uh, the availability of the contract. Okay. All right. Jumping back to one of our first questions here involving blue bonnets. Um, Matt, any tips for getting blue bonnets to grow in the panhandle? <laughs> you know, I'm, I, I, I'm not uh, so much a gardener. I, I'm not involved in that horticultural aspect. I, I don't know. Um, one one recommendation would be to select um, species. Maybe if you could find maybe not the typical Texas blue bonnet. Maybe look at uh, Lupinus subcarnosus, which is more prone to sandier soils. Um, there are a couple of other. There, there's um, see if I can get a link here to throw it in the chat. There's the Lupinus. I think it's our 
gentius is one of the native it's rare in the panhandle now but it used to be more widespread um I'm just going to put this in here and you might look for a species of native lupine closer to your area. And that might help more, you know, if you're trying to just plant the standard Texas blue bonnet or something like that, it may not be appropriate for that area. Great. Thanks. Um, yeah. And you are doing great with all the, the Latin names. I would be butchering those because again, I'm a historian, so I'm learning a lot here, but um we got another question. Um, where can someone go to get started if they wanted to plant rare species on their own private land? Is there, I mean, we've got some good books in the chat listed. Um, Matt shared some good websites. And I don't know if you wanted to reiterate those real quick, just so everybody's aware of them, Matt. Yeah, you know, I think the first part is to, to figure out what's appropriate for where you're at um, and, you know, get some species that you're interested in. There are some, so Native Plant Society of Texas, each year they have plant sales across the state. And so figure what your local chapter is and get involved with Native Plant Society of Texas. And they'll often at these plant sales have these rare species that are native to your area and hard to find. And we've been able to get some, uh, ours even sell, you know, you can legally sell an own um, Endangered species, federal listed species, if you have a receipt from a, a certified nursery. So they'll sell uh, certain. We have Phlox nivalis subspecies texensis, which is a Texas tree of phlox. You can buy at those events uh, in my local chapter. Um, and Natchez River rose mallow, it's, a, it's an endangered hibiscus or threatened hibiscus, rather. So, Native Plant Society of Texas, those annual plant sales, typically they have one in the spring and the fall. That's a great place to get those. Um, the plants themselves and there you can tap in their huge knowledge base so you have folks there that have you know intimate knowledge of native plants as well as you know their uh, cultivation and things like that so keeping them uh, in your home garden they'll, they'll certainly know more about that than i would um and there you know there's other there's other good seed companies i know native american seed is one that sells native species and things like that there you can find a lot of those a lot of times they're smaller local Areas, you know, you're not going to find a lot of this stuff at Lowe's or Home Depot, but you can find these smaller local companies that deal with regional varieties of certain species and things like that. So, I would recommend looking into some of that. Great, good resources. Thank you. Uh, another question, maybe for Travis or even Sandra: How does right-of-way prep and soil stabilization, with the introduction of topsoil that may or may not be from the area, affect native species survival or establishment? I'll let Travis take that one. <laughs> okay. So <clears throat> the top so topsoil is supposed to uh, come with it from within the area, if if possible. Okay. Um, and that's kind of the, the short end of that. How does it uh, affect? You know, we understand and and uh, there might be other foreign material in that topsoil, and that's something we we have to just we need the topsoil uh, if we bring in topsoil. Uh, if it is a if it is a uh, project that's uh, topsoil is being removed, it's supposed to be stock. It needs to be stockpiled, so they can be reused. Um, so, I think I might have answered that question. <laughs> so. Okay. Yeah. No. That that sounds good. Let's see what else. Again, so many questions, you guys. We really are excited that you're excited about this topic. Just trying to make sure I'm trying to answer as many as I can as possible. I know there was a lot of interest too in the pollinators um, and the monarch and the pollinator program. So, um, let's see if I can find that question. One second. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Travis, can you give us just a little bit more background about the types of um, plants and species that are specific to pollinators that we like to plant in the right of way and at those rest areas? Uh, well, there's several and in, in, in the rest areas, um, it's, it's kind of been a little tricky over the times uh, from what I'm, I'm understanding. I, I was, for the rest areas I was um, in with it uh, from the initial and then um, and then some 
they've had to come in and replant over time because, like I said, we had to work on some drainage issues and things of that sort around the buildings. Um, but, you know, obviously some of our venas are in there. We've got some uh, firewheel in there. Um, out in our open areas, we have uh, um, just a, I'm trying to think, you know, you put me on the spot, I just went blank and I, I deal with these every day. Um, but basically our, our uh, big five, we do do some, uh, some milkweed plantings in our open areas, not in our bed, bedded areas. Uh, we do some milkweed available and, and pricing on that. Um, is is we can we can make that work as well as the uh, like I said the the fire wheel, um, which is also known as the Indian blanket um, Indian paintbrush. If we can get some paintbrush, depending on uh, what's available. One thing I'd like to just kind of to to add to all this is it just depends on what's available in the price. If we're only allowed to spend a dollar, I'm going to do as many. Um, as much as I can to cover as much acreage or much area as I can dollar um, and to uh, take care of all pollinators. Great. Um, another question about mowing, popular topic. What should be done if mowing is done before wildflowers go to seed or if they're mowed too short? Is there anything that can be done to help save the, that wildflower? Um, in, in some situations, we've come back and replanted. Um, and what we do, it depends on if it's going to be drill seeded or if it's going to be uh, thrown out, uh, just for all practical purposes, the easiest way to understand is to be hand thrown out like mother nature would do, uh, depending on what's gonna happen. Now, they're native and they don't all come up the first year. Um, that's mother nature and that's her way of uh, plants. And so typically we'll step back and wait a year or two to see, and it depends on what kind of weather we've had that year. If we had a bad year, wait another year. Um, but uh, we have in the past gone in and replanted. Okay. Yeah, lots of factors that I wouldn't think about um, that all go into helping our roadsides look as beautiful as they do. And some of those are, are out of our control, like Mother Nature, but we do what we can. She always wins. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. I'm looking through the questions again. Thank you everybody too for adding to the chat. Sorry, go ahead, Travis. I saw a couple of questions about iNaturalist. If you don't, if, if I can sure. just jump in real quick. Um, I think one of the chapters was about, you know, if you know, if you find a rare plant or something like that in iNaturalist, should should you add it? Or should you, if you find a rare plant location, should you add it to iNaturalist? And if so, should you obscure it? And I would say yes to both. Uh, iNaturalist is a, a, a very valuable resource and it's one that my group utilizes both for plants and, and various animals. Um, and there are a couple of uh, groups and I naturalist there's a rare plants of Texas group and there's just the overall uh, general plants of Texas group. And uh, I, I always obscure everything. I would recommend obscuring everything. The, the folks that would actually utilize those data, they can see where it's at, but that keeps folks who, who might be interested in collecting or, or whatever, you know, from being able to see where they are. A lot of the, the there are certain species that I naturalist flags is rare or endangered or whatever that they automatically obscure locations. But I definitely recommend obscuring and I definitely recommend adding, you know, one thing that I've been interested in looking at is trying to to get a hold on which species are important for monarchs for pollination. And that, you know, part of that involves tagging monarch observations with the nectar plant that they might be on. So, you know, I mean, we know milkweeds are important for reproduction. That's where their, their eggs are laid. That's, that's what their caterpillars feed on, but the adults feed on a variety of nectar plants. And if we can get a handle on what some of those plants are in our right of way, we might be able to get an idea of how to better plant and how to better manage, you know, certain species for that. So yes, please use a naturalist, please, um, uh, you know, obscure your locations, particularly if you have a rare sensitive species or something like that. But yeah, it's, it's a very valuable resource. Great. Thanks for that. Okay. I think we're nearing the end of our time. So I want to move on and just wrap a couple of things up. We've got our Q and a done. Um, there are some pages on our text website that you can check out to visit some of the resources that we've mentioned here or learn more about the wildflower program and all the work that we do. One of the easiest ways to find this information is just to go to the TechSot website and use the keyword wildflowers. It'll list right there all the pages that we have related to that topic. Um, you don't have to worry about any long URLs or that kind of thing. So again, just use the keyword wildflowers and that will take you where you need to go. 
Um, and with that, I want to thank everybody again for their time today to our wonderful presenters. So much good information. Um, I learned a lot and thank you all um, virtually um, by phone for joining us today. We had a record turnout for our beyond the road chat. So um, I do want to remind you again to visit our virtual training platform for section 106. Um, you can also take that survey that I put in the chat way at the beginning um, about uh, preservation and you will get a seed packet. I'll pop it in the chat one last time here. And if you have any questions, please reach out to us. Um, we'll be happy to answer anything related to preservation or wildflowers are, are beyond the roadside chats. And stay tuned for our next one in October. It'll be all about archaeology for Archaeology Month. And with that, I'm going to say thank you again to our panelists and thanks uh, for joining us. Have a great afternoon. Take care. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye.